Welcome back to the Fell Engine Project, where I'm building a 3.5 inch gauge live steam locomotive to my own drawings. On this episode, I make traction crank axles, which are located vertically for the centre rail drive wheels. If you want to learn more about their use, check out the link in the top right hand corner, How Does a Fell Engine Work? There's a couple of ways I could have made these crank axles, one out of separate pieces, or as I've chosen to do, out of a single piece, starting with a section of 40mm mild steel round bar. This has centre holes drilled in each end, using the self-centering three-jaw chuck on the lathe, which ensures the hole is concentric with the part. Once that's complete, I scribe a parallel line on each end then take it over to the mill to drill an offset centre hole on each end. We'll come back to how this is going to be used shortly. First, the part is set up between centres on the lathe, driven by a lathe dog. I didn't have a lathe dog large enough for this, so I ended up fabricating one out of some scrap parts around the workshop. It's certainly not the prettiest thing, but it'll do the trick for today's part. Proceed to rough out the part, removing a bulk of the material. This helps reduce weight before we get to turning the part eccentrically. I leave the shafts oversized at this point. This helps with the extra rigidity. Now is a good time to explain how I'm going to turn the eccentric crank. The part has two centre holes drilled. One concentrically for turning all the concentric features. And a second centre drilled in line with the crank. Which I'll use to turn the crank feature. This makes the 40mm rod effectively 70mm as I start turning. With most of the rotation ear turning and a very small cut. As the diameter reduces, the cut length will increase until we reach continuous turning as the part is nearly finished. Care needs to be taken at this point to ensure the cutter clears the part as the rotation has started. With such a large eccentric movement, you'll be caught off guard by where the tool actually is. I use a parting blade to make the cut and found after some trial and error that the smaller blade of the parting tool minimised chatter with my light bench top lathe. One thing to note at this point is I'm running the lathe as slow as it can run, which is about 100 rpm. My lathe is electronic variable, which means at 100 rpm I have very little torque. So the biggest challenge is avoiding stalling the machine, so the cut depth needs to be very, very shallow. I repeatedly sharpen the high speed steel parting blade, as this helps with the cut. As the crank diameter reduces, I quietly increase the speed until I get to approximately 200 rpm as I get close to final size, but that's some way off yet. At this point I've got the parting blade set relatively short, which increases the rigidity of the setup. Once I've run out of depth on the parting blade, I stop and make a second cut beside the first. This is slightly easier than the first cut, with a little bit more chip clearance from the hole beside it.
once the full width of the cut has been made, I can extend the parting blade to continue cutting deeper. I use my Edge Technology Speedy Lathe Gauge to set the tool height. As the tool holder has an incline, the parting blade will increase in height as it's extended forward. Once the eccentric is turned down to about the centre line, I swap back to turning concentrically, so I can turn the shafts down to final diameter, along with removing any additional material beside the eccentric. The reason I switch at this point is the part will start to lose its rigidity as we continue to cut the centre crank. At this point you get a really good view of how little material is left in the centre of the crank already. I use the putting tool to finish the shafts, as I find it easier than switching between left and right hand cutters given the depth. It's then time to switch back to the eccentric setup, once again using the offset centre holes. As you'll notice the cutting speed is now sped up, moving closer to 200 rpm as I get closer to the final size. The cut length is now much longer, with three quarters of the rotation now being cut to a quarter being ear turning. One thing I will note is it's just as frightening to turn as it looks, with it taking me some time to gain confidence, having a part moving so wildly in the lathe. At this point I've just started making full cuts, now just reducing the eccentric crank to its final size. The part is very fragile at this point, with very little rigidity between the two shafts. This will be our final look at the eccentric crank in the lathe, as before I proceed any further, an aluminium picker is inserted to prevent the part from folding up under load. This is held in place with some electrical tape. I learnt inserting this packer was necessary in my first attempt and failure, as when I placed it back between concentric centres and tightened the tailstock, the part folded. Another thing to mention at this point as each of these cranks took 6 or 7 hours to turn, and I need 4 of them. I ended up having 3 failures as well, which meant this took much longer than I was expecting. Speaking of failures, this is the one of the failures I had. I was just finishing the eccentric, when the parting tool caught and folded the part in two. Let's say I wasn't in the best of moods after that, but I got over it. I certainly recommend being extra cautious as the eccentric crank gets to its final size. Increasing the diameter of the eccentric crank also would have been helpful. Final reliefs were then cut on the ends of the shafts, before parting the ends off the shafts. Most of the way, I finished this up in the vise afterwards, with a hacksaw. At this point the turning was complete, with one last process left to be completed, cutting the counterbalance shape. I did this using a hacksaw, and then finishing it with a file. I could then locate the crankshafts into their axle boxes. As you'll notice this area is already getting busy and we still need connecting rods. These crankshafts were a real challenge to make, but I think they were well worth it in the end. Turning one piece crankshafts certainly has an advantage, ensuring the entire assembly is concentric, but as I've found there's little room for error. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please like and share. 
And if you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe. I look forward to seeing you for the next episode. Catch you next time.